What is going on, everyone? On today's show, I got a big update regarding Street Fighter VI, including my new performance since I've returned to the game in the last week, as well as my getting banned from playing online. Also, an update regarding an upcoming documentary about me and how I'm going to be approaching it. And, very interesting news story to dis discuss today. So we've got a lot going on on today's episode of the Level 1 Podcast. <music> Alrighty, good morning everyone, and welcome to the show. Today is April 13th, 2024, a Saturday, and I say welcome to all of my regular viewers and people who enjoy my content here on DSP Gaming, as well as to the thousands of idiots who rewatch this on another channel that snips out of context and makes me look bad. Welcome anyway. I hope you're all feeling well and having a good weekend. Um, well, <clears throat> we have a few interesting topics today for sure to discuss. First of all, another very minor improvement, but one that is much appreciated. Uh, OP Boone helped me to understand how to get this leaderboard to auto center. You know, something that I could have used for the last seven years. <laughs> so now, when I actually update this leaderboard with any information, for example, watch this, it just auto centers. So I don't have to keep moving it. That didn't work. Wait a minute. Maybe I have to do it on every single page. I do have to do it on every single page. Oh, every single page I use it, I have to set this. So now it's screwed up. Now it's screwed up. <laughs> okay, well it would have been centered, except that I have to set it up on every page I use it, which I didn't know. Let's see what happens here. It auto-centered, see that? So now if I type it again, It worked. See that? Cool. Okay, so now I don't have to mess around with the leaderboard as much, which is excellent. Uh, any little improvements, always greatly appreciated. Shout out to OP Boone, who sent me the instructions on how to do that. And now that makes it a little bit easier. So, welcome to the show, everyone. And uh, we got a lot to talk about today. All right, first of all, as you know, in the last week, I have mixed up the content on this channel to make it feel more fresh. And one of the things that I did is I returned to Street Fighter VI. After two and a half months away, uh, Friday Night Fights returning, but also mixing in a few other sessions during the course of the week. And I have an update not only on my performance of how I did this return week, but also of something that happened last night where I was not allowed to play multiplayer, at least in a full capacity, for a limited time. And it very much frustrated me. And I think that this system should be improved, so we'll talk a little bit about that. In addition, last night there was a big public announcement and update regarding an upcoming documentary about me that is going to literally be the longest work ever done on me ever in the history of the internet. And we'll talk about that and its release date and how I'm going to be approaching and covering it and stuff like that. In addition to that, just listen to this one. There's a news story today. There is a game studio, an indie game studio, that was developing a video game. Someone from Kotaku, as you know, one of the internet based journalism sites for gaming. I say journalism very loosely there. Um, basically, someone from Kotaku interviewed a bunch of employees of the company, and apparently now the company is closing. It's the weirdest story. I, I have word for word the statement from the CEO of the company who decided overnight to close his game dev company. And the reasoning given, and everyone's scratching their head like, what happened here? It's a really weird story. Uh, so, a good variety of topics that we'll be covering here today on the show. I feel like, before we get to the schedule, before we get to anything else, let's talk about Street Fighter Six because guess what? That's what I did last night, and I always recap what I did the day before. Uh, yesterday, I played Helldivers 2. Went well. Uh, for the most part, unlocked a bunch of new stuff. The auto cannon, which seems to be a really strong um, weapon that you can use. Um... 
And so I'm having a good time with the game, you know, continuing with progress, leveling up. I think I went from like level eight to level 11 yesterday. Uh, people seem to enjoy the gameplay and had a good time on the stream. So good stuff and hoping to keep that in the major rotation and that interest will not wane. You know, the further I play, the tougher it's getting, but I'm also getting the better stratagems. So it's kind of almost even handed there. Like, yes, you get overwhelmed, but since you have the better stratagems, you have a better chance to play better and keep the enemies off of you and stuff like that, right? So, cool. I had a good time. I hope you'll check out the gameplay and maybe check out the next stream later in the week. Um, so last night was Friday night, and you know what that means. On Friday nights, we have Friday night fights here on DSP Gaming, and it was time for more Street Fighter Six. and this time around, I wanted to play with Honda, okay? My final character... Out of the five characters that I had used the most in Street Fighter VI, you know, last year when it came out, uh, and also a character that I have in Master Ranking. So last night, I played for about two to two and a half hours with Honda. And as you know, since I've returned to Street Fighter VI in the last week, I'm only playing casual play so far because I feel that's the best way to approach it. I don't want to jump right into try-hard mode ranked play when I'm rusty and don't even remember strategies and have, you know, poor execution. I basically wanted to give a chance to each character to get back into uh, oiled, well-oiled uh, form, you know, get the rust out of the joints. And so, that's what I've been doing. But, sadly, some of the shortcomings of casual play matches, if, as opposed to the ranked matches, is that trolls can try to hone in on my matches and try to join me, and basically, I guess the way it works on PlayStation Network is you could just keep changing your name on PlayStation Network, and you could have the same Capcom ID account. So technically, you're the same account playing, but you could change your your name like every game. So I didn't even know this, but there were people who have been like stream sniping me in Street Fighter Six for months and months, and just keep changing their name. So I don't know it's the same person. Okay, and it's funny because people are like, "Yeah, you know, half the time when they try to stream snipe you, you kick their asses." So they end up looking like idiots and I'm like no I don't know that I, I literally don't know who's stream sniping me I don't care I just play right but excuse me in the last week some of these people started using very offensive names and things that obviously I, I, I can't have on my streams um so basically I'm like I gotta stop this how do you stop it so first I was trying to click if you just quit out of the match right then you don't have to face them anymore the problem is if you quit out of a match all right it doesn't register as a completed match, and therefore you're not able to ban the account. So, for example, last week, there was a Cami who I fought like four times in a row, each one with a different name. And then I realized, I think this might be the same person. So I went in, blocked one name. I said, block that person. I don't want to play him again. They're a troll. And it blocked all four accounts, so I, I never have to fight that person ever again. Their Capcom ID is blocked. I was like, ah. But then, I go to play another match against someone else, and it's a really offensive name, so I just quit out of the match. I closed the game. I go back in, and now it won't let me block that person because the match didn't complete, so it never registered. <clears throat> so basically, in the last week or so, I've been trying to figure out how this is going to work for casual play. Now, in reality, it might not always be an issue because I play ranked a lot too. I just haven't played ranked in the last week because, I, like I said, I'm trying to get the rust off before I try to go somewhere where my points uh, could be, my precious ranked points, like it really matters so much. <clears throat> but... Since they'll be at stake, and since it could basically push me into an awful player pool by losing a ton of points, I don't want just want to, you know, artificially right out of the gates lose all my points and be stuck in the dredges of Street Fighter Six forever because I'm rusty. Okay, so um, basically, like over the last week, I probably quit out of maybe two or three matches as these trolls kept using offensive names, and then I would eventually realize that's stupid. Don't do that anymore you know, block, just block the account after a match. But I didn't realize that until last night. So last night, no kidding, like right first, first or second match, I think it was the second match, it was a troll. And I'm like, all right, so I quit out. And that's when I realized, crap, I can't block him. I was like, all right, moving forward, I just won't rage quit a match anymore. It's not really rage quitting. I'm not raging. I'm quitting because it's an offensive name. Um, I'm just not going to do that anymore. I'm just going to wait for the match to end and I just block the person and we move on. So I go to play again. So this is only like after I did one legit match, I think, with Honda. And then we had the one troll, and that was it. So then I go in, and I'm trying to match make, and nothing's working. It's just sitting there endlessly searching and finding nobody. And I was like, huh? What the hell's going on? So eventually, 
Uh, it finds a match. It took ages. And it has a hand with a big yellow card in it on the screen. And I said, I have you know, been playing this since launch 10 months ago. I probably have 10,000 matches under my belt. I have no idea what that, that means. And people are like, this is Capcom's flagging system. So the way it works is, if you are found to have been someone who pulled from multiple matches in a set period of time, Capcom flags your account and gives you a yellow card. What the yellow card means is now for a temporary period of time, I think it's three matches, you can only match make with other people who have been flagged as basically quitters or pullers. And I was like, huh? I don't think about this. Number one, the only reason that I quit out of any of those matches is because they were trolls. There were people who were harassing me or bullying me or had a really offensive name. It's not like I don't want to play people. Of course I do. I'm not losing a match and getting upset and saying, well, fuck this, and then quitting because of the quality of the match or to be a poor sport. These are people who are actively stalking and harassing me on the internet, and I don't want that to permeate my content, so I, and I choose to terminate that, terminate the bullying avenue, right? Now, certainly, I'm not saying that Capcom is responsible for online bullying, but there should be some method of discernment between the reasoning why someone may be quitting out of a match. For example, what if your internet's messed up one day, and you didn't know that, and you go to play, and right in the middle of a match, your internet goes out, right? And then maybe later on, two days later, the same thing happens, and then maybe one day later, it's like, damn it, my internet has issues, I need to get it fixed. Oh, now, by the way, you now you're screwed, and you can't find anyone to play online. But I didn't actively do anything wrong, you know? I think what it is, it's an arbitrary system that Capcom put in there because it's basically they want something in there to say we're trying, but they didn't actually want to put any effort into it. So it's a very lazy system. It's very arbitrary. If you quit like three or four times in, in a week, then you get flagged, play three matches, get unflagged. No actual looking at the situation, no actual consideration of what's really going on. It's just a blanket policy because so there's a policy in place. And you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of YouTube. Because YouTube has exactly the same kinds of policies, okay? <clears throat> For example, on YouTube, if someone issues a copyright claim against your content, all right, YouTube is supposed to verify that it's legit, but a lot of the times they don't. They claim they do, but a lot of the times they don't. Or they have a very inept person reviewing the situation, and they grant the claim when it's blatantly false, okay? <clears throat> then it's up to you the content creator or uploader or YouTuber to fix that issue on the back end. And you might say, well, I don't understand. Why does YouTube just blanket do that? Because all they want to do is protect themselves legally. You have to understand. They don't want to be involved in a copyright dispute. So they just like, well, hands off. We'll just grant everything. And it's the same thing here. Capcom doesn't want to get into the semantics of why someone might be dropping from a match but they don't want people rampantly doing it, so they have this blanket arbitrary system. It's very stupid. <clears throat> Number one, it makes no sense because there's no discernment between ranked and casual. In ranked play, where points are on the line, and if you cheat, you can potentially retain your points and artificially inflate your account, as opposed to if you just play legit, you could lose points and not be as high ranked then it's a concern. In fact, we were just recently talking about this in Tekken 8, that until recently, like two weeks ago, people were infamously pulling the plug on ranked play and keeping all their ranking points for losses. So people were at the top of the leaderboards that actually weren't good. They were just cheaters, right? <clears throat> so they finally, Bandai Namco, instituted a system to detect it, and they banned the biggest offenders. And LTG was actually one of them, which is pretty funny. And so everyone had to start from scratch and try to build their way up from the bottom again. Um... So I get it on ranked play. That totally makes sense. In casual play, there is literally nothing at stake. Zero. If you quit, nothing changes. It doesn't matter. It, it, the, the, the games are literally pointless. They're just for practice. That's hence the name casual play. This is the equivalent of you're in an arcade, and you're playing someone in an arcade cabinet, and you get a phone call, you got to walk away. So you just quit the game and let the guy beat you up, and the next guy steps up to play. It, it's not a big deal. Right? It doesn't even make sense.
right? <clears throat> it's like, huh? Why are you going to penalize me because I, I had to do something else? It wasn't in the middle of a tournament where you, you destroyed the integrity of the competitive play of the tournament. So this system, in my opinion, should apply to ranked and not to casual. I don't even see the point of it applying to casual play. That's number one. Number two, this system should look at big picture because right now it's such a simplistic system if it happens a certain amount of times in a week you get penalized once you play three matches the penalty removes all right that's dumb that's really dumb why because i'm someone who has played this game probably ten thousand matches correct ten thousand and in that regard i've pulled what four times in the last week and it was all for trolls harassing me it wasn't because i was being a poor sport, these were all trolls doing fucked up things. Right? So, in this case, 10,000 matches played, 4 dropped, penalized the player. Huh? You have to understand that in life there's outliers. Right? In life, you have to give something the benefit of the doubt. If something has happened 4 times in 10,000, it's not a common occurrence and no one should be punished because it was some kind of an outlier situation. It should look at that. It shouldn't just be arbitrarily, oh, dropped your match four times in a week, you're banned, or you're penalized. It should be, wow, okay, yes, it happened a few times, but dude, big picture, you got a ridiculous amount of matches that are completed. You have to hit. You should have to hit a certain percent. You should. You should have to be have to hit a certain percent, and then you get the penalty. In my opinion. So these are just all suggestions. Number one, it shouldn't apply to casual plat matches, only ranked. Number two, it should be a certain percent rating. It shouldn't be just arbitrary certain amount in a certain time. Because again, you get people who get smacked with this who didn't do anything wrong. Maybe their internet's messed up or whatever, and they didn't even know. This is really dumb in my opinion. Um. Anyway, the good news is it wasn't a huge deal. We had to play like three matches. It took like 45 minutes. What I had to do, I had to open up my, my search to worldwide. I had to open up my connections to all connections. And I had to basically make it cross-play ranked and casual and then i got three matches it still took a while but we got three matches they were laggy as shit but it didn't matter i was like just play them as long as they're completed they count and once the three matches were complete now i was out of that system and i was back to getting full you know matches right away again so it's a stupid system i understand why capcom has it in place at the same time man that's poorly implemented that is lazy man's game dev right there like there's no reason for it to be that simple it definitely could have some more effort put into it and I hope that they will improve it in the future, especially if they want online play to be considered uh, serious, which in my opinion, it's not anyway, because I think the net code is ridiculous, but that's another story entirely. Uh, so anyway, that happened yesterday. And FYI now, I've played with all five of my characters who I have used in Street Fighter VI since its launch at a serious level. And just so you know, the characters are Blanca, Lily, Zangief, Dalsim, and E. Honda. You might notice something from all those characters I just mentioned. They're all mid to low tier. The characters that I like how they play because they're unique or different or interesting are all mid to low tier characters in this game. I didn't play with one top tier character at all. I really didn't. If you look, like I didn't play with Jerry. I didn't play with Ken. I tried Luke for a little bit. I never really got into him. Uh, I didn't play with Guile. I didn't play with uh, DJ. I tried DJ once at the beginning. Hated the new build because he plays nothing like old DJ and I just never went back. Like, every single freaking character that I'm using in this game is a mid to low tier character. So it's always a losing battle. You know what I'm saying? It's like you're always fighting uphill every fight. Anyway, here are my statistics, and they're kind of interesting. So just listen to this. Blanca. I only played for an hour with Blanca. 16 wins, 17 losses. They might say, wait, what? Blanca's like your best character, or close to your best character at least. How do you have so many losses? Well, keep in mind we were doing casual play. I was fighting a master ranked Ed who was actually very good. And it was the first time I had ever fought an Ed. So I didn't know what Ed could do in this game. And I went 3-10 and 10 against him. Okay? So if you actually erase the set of Ed, which was kind of this interesting experiment of me trying to learn, I actually went 13-7 and 7 with Blanca. Okay? But, I mean, who cares? It's just semantics. I mean, we know that Blanca is one of my better characters, right? <clears throat> uh, with Lily, I went 11 and 12. That's not surprising. Lily is by far probably the worst of all the characters I'm using. She just doesn't have very good tools at all. 
and I feel like she is one of the characters that is most is screaming for improvement when this game gets a Season 2 update later this year. She needs to have better invincibility and reversals and ways out of stuff. She needs to have better priority. Like, her problem right now is that she gets dominated by Rushdown. She can't keep Rushdown characters off of her at all. The moment they're in her face, she is dead. <clears throat> and that's half the game. <clears throat> so... Yeah, it sucks because I like that character. I thought it was a nice, unique build. I just find it funny because she's supposed to be the successor of T-Hawk, right? And T-Hawk always sucked ass except for one version of him ever. Old T-Hawk from Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo is actually one of the best characters in fighting game history, but you have to play him perfectly. Then you could do these unstoppable, unbreakable throw tick throw traps. But outside of that one version of T-Hawk, the rest have always been crap. So now let's have a successor of T-Hawk. Oh, by the way, she's crap. Like, what? Can you give us a break? <laughs> Please, can you give us a fucking break here? You know? But anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, Zangief, I went 14 and 14 while drinking during my birthday marathon. So that's pretty good, I feel. I, I'd probably get better with Zangief the more I play with him. Uh, Dalsim, I went 36 and 25. And keep in mind, that was a full two to two and a half hour session. So actually a good winning record there. With E-Honda last night, 25 and 21. So winning, but not very winning. Almost breaking even, okay? <clears throat> so, not surprised that Dalsim, I did the best. Seriously, I'm not. And Blanca, like I said, if I hadn't done that set with Ed, would have been 13 and 7 and would have been a winning record too. So that's how we're doing. Now, moving forward. Okay, the next character I want to use again is Blanca. I only got to play with him for about an hour. So probably the next night session that I do with Street Fighter VI will be exclusively Blanca. And yes, I'm still going to be doing casual play. Um, I'm not going to be jumping into ranked as of yet. I want to get a little bit more practice under my belt with these characters before we go. And I will go to rank. Don't worry. Remember, all my, my points reset to 1,500. So we're going to rank. It's happening. But I want to get a tiny bit more practice here before we jump in. So probably full Blanca stream next time around when I play. Okay? Cool. So now since we're into it, let's talk about the schedule. Then I'd like to talk about an update regarding this documentary that we now have more information about coming out later this year about me. Uh, and then I want to have an interesting news story and then we can do shout outs and the like. Okay? So schedule-wise, today is an exciting day. We got Elden Ring continuing here on the first stream. Last time around, we entered the frozen mountaintops of the Giants, and we fought a bunch of bosses, and we did a bunch of stuff. Today, we're going to continue on. We've got to finish Castle Soul, which is going to take a little bit. Then we're going to continue on with the frozen... I think we'll just keep going through that frozen giant area. Uh, we'll probably get to the big boss at the end, which is what the fire giant or whatever he's called. Try to figure out how to beat him with my magic build. And, you know, enkindle the fucking thing, the gauntlet or whatever it is, and then doesn't it take you to Pharaoh Missoula first, I think it does? So we'll probably do that. Like, I'm thinking that's that's what we could do today. Now, there's still lots of other stuff to do. We still have to go the other direction once we get the other half of the medallion from Castle Soul to unlock the Haley Tree. We also have to find a way to get underground into the Blood Temple of Moog, because that's the tough area we need to beat to get to the DLC in June. So we have a lot of content still left in the game, and I'll do whatever you guys want. You know, if you guys recommend I do something in a different order, I'm down for that. It's really whatever you guys think. Okay, so let me know. Um, but I think today should be good progress and fun. I'm getting some recommendations now. People are like, you know, you have better spells. You have this big sword spell you got from the Magic Dragon, and you didn't even try it. You should try it. Oh, okay. So maybe we will. Maybe we'll try some new stuff today. We'll see. See how it goes. Um, tonight on the late stream, it is a big stream because it is the premiere of Co-op with My Wife Cat. We're going to be doing Beyond Two Souls right here on DSP Gaming Live. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's going to be pretty exciting uh, and fun. My wife has never played this game before, nor does she know the story. So she's excited because she likes Quantic Dream games and she wants to play this one. She never had opportunity to play it herself, so now she'll be able to play it in a co-op capacity. Now, before people get ahead of themselves, the game's not full of co-op. Even though they sold it and claimed it was, it was kind of a lie. The game basically has two characters. The main character, who is a girl who grows into a woman who makes life choices and becomes this agent and secret agent and stuff like that. It's pretty insane, the plot of this game. But it has a supernatural twist because she has a, like a supernatural entity that's tethered to her. And that's really what this story is, beyond two souls. It's her, but there's two souls involved with her. And if you play the game full co-op with two controllers, it's kind of silly because... 
90% of the game is the girl, like 10% is controlled by the supernatural character. So it's really not co-op. It's like one person just sits there doing nothing for the majority of the game. And then every once in a while it has a button input. Okay? So in reality, do we need two controllers? We really don't. Likely what we will do is she will control the main character. And then if we decide, you know, maybe pass me the controller when it's going to be the, the supernatural character's choices and I can make those choices or control that character or whatever. Or she could just do it all. It's not that big of a deal. But I'll be here for co-op commentary. Okay, and to run the stream essentially to make sure you know the chat's running, shout outs for for you know contributions, questions and stuff like that while she's basically playing the game. Now, we have two headsets. I've already charged both. We're good to go there. We got a splitter audio. Everything's good there. The one challenge is going to be the microphone because as we were doing the Dondoko Island co-op, basically the, there was no perfect spot where we could put the mic, right? So I'm thinking what we will do, because she's going to probably be sitting like right here, and I'm going to be sitting here. We'll probably try to put the mic in front of her, since she's the person who's going to be playing primarily, and we want to hear her commentary more. And when I'm going to say something, I'll just lean forward. Now, we have new filters on this microphone, okay? And these filters have been in place for about a month, and I feel like they're working really well. I mean, I hope that you guys feel the same. Um, those filters include, hold on, a noise gate, noise suppression, and a limiter. All right, so what I'm gonna understand is, basically I should have, I forget which one it was, if it was noise gate or noise suppression, but one of those, what it does, is it allows it so that distant noises or low noises cannot be heard on the mic. So, for example, you used to be able to hear a clicking when I did this. You hear nothing now, right? That's my mouse clicking. You would literally hear that mouse clicking constantly with the old settings. With this new filter, you don't hear that background noise anymore. Okay, and that's a huge improvement because the clicking is annoying. Okay, so what we might do if we start and we realize you just cannot hear both of us, I may take the filter off just for this co-op playthrough and then bring it back for everything else. I think for the, for the co-op, it might be warranted. Now, some people have suggested, why don't you just buy a second mic? And it's like, you want me to buy a second professional mic, a second tripod, all this setup, which is probably going to cost, I mean, honestly, probably about 100, 200 bucks. Just for, for when we do co-op. You want me to bring in a whole big rig, a new mic. I mean, I could. It's possible. But I'm not so sure that that's necessary. Uh, you know, if let me put it this way. If we do this and it really sounds atrocious and it's really bad, then I will actually consider buying a new microphone and a new set. You know, I basically could just get an, exactly what I have or very close to what I have. My audio device here, this Scarlet audio interface thing actually has two inputs so i could just get the plug the mic into the second input it'll it'll put both into the same line of audio and that'd be fine okay so i guess we'll see how it goes tonight but i'm excited i think it's going to be great two hours of beyond two souls co-op for the record the game's not very long i believe most people beat the game between 10 and 12 hours I guess dependent on how you know how it goes, if we're interacting with the audience, you know how long the playthrough will be. But we're planning on doing it once a week, just for clarification purposes. We're probably going to aim for every Saturday night moving forward. So every Saturday night there will be a two-hour session of Beyond Two Souls for you know the foreseeable future until basically the game's beaten. Okay, I think it'll be fun. Uh, I think you guys, if you come out, you're gonna have a good time with us. It's very different from the Dundoko Island where. We got bored of it within two sessions. In this case, it's a narrative-based game. It's riveting. It hooks you, and you want to keep going to see where the plot's going. So I don't think we're going to have the kind of issues that we had back when we were doing Dundoko Island. It's going to be a very different experience, okay? Cool. So that's tonight. Tomorrow is React Day. We have the DSP versus the Internet Clips React Show over on my DSP Reacts channel. And then we've got the late-night retro react stream of The Walking Dead, the Telltale series, season one, episode two, on the late stream over on DSP Throwback. I know it's such a giant mouthful to say that. At first, it was just The Walking Dead game. That's what people called it. The Walking Dead episode two. But now, because it's a Telltale series and there's other Walking Dead games, because they had multiple seasons, because all that, you have to say all that, and it's like 400 fucking words. It sounds like a paragraph of a name. But anyway, it should be fun. Last week, we reacted to the first episode, and it went really, really well. And uh, I hope that you guys will join us for part two tomorrow night. Monday, it's going to be more uh, Helldivers 2, 
and Monday night, I'm actually going to finish up Alone in the Dark with the Emily side run. Sadly, as I explained yesterday, we can't get any of the secret endings, which is really dumb, because <clears throat> I missed literally one collectible in the entirety of the game, and it's like, no secret endings for one mi missed mo item. It's pretty stupid, but it is what it is. Tuesday, there's a new game called Harold Halibut. It's an indie game that looks like Claymation, and it's on Game Pass, and it looks unique. I actually don't know what the gameplay mechanics are, but the game just looks like something special and different, and I want to try it. So we're going to do that as the mainstream on Tuesday. If it sucks, it sucks. We never have to play it again, but I'd like to give it a shot and see exactly what it is and see if we enjoy it or not, okay? Tuesday night will be Street Fighter Six, and like I said, that whole stream will be Blanca. And then Wednesday, uh, probably... <clears throat> excuse me. On Wednesday, probably more Elden Ring. And then Wednesday night is up in the air. We could do Helldivers 2. We could do more Herald Halibut. You know, we could just have a chill night where we just hang out for, for, you know, two hours and chat, which we haven't done. In, we've been doing like one a month, and they usually do really well. We could play some Battlefront Classic Collection. So I'm kind of leaving Wednesday night completely open as a whatever stream, all right? Now, also coming up this month, there's another game in about another week's time, and I think it's called, like, Another Man's Treasure, or Another Crab's Treasure, and it's supposed to essentially be a FromSoft-style Soulsborne game with crabs and aquatic creatures. So that sounds fascinating to me, and again, I think it's another Game Pass game. It's like, wow, you know, Game Pass right now seems like it's going to be really handy in this time when there's not a lot of giant releases, to be able to access all these smaller games and try them out. And again, if they're good, play them and keep them in the rotation. If they're not so good, no risk, no skin off my back because, hey, they're free. So just play them, right? So it could be fun. So anyway, yeah, that's coming up. I think that's going to be a fun, you know, second half of the month, essentially, coming up. Good variety stuff while we continue on with the ongoing playthroughs that I'm doing. Okay? So that's the schedule. Keep in mind, we are currently thinking about the next marathon to do, and I think the next marathon we will do will likely be in late uh, May. What will it be? Well, here are our ideas. Number one, the fighting game Fiesta, where basically we do a variety of fighting game related stuff, including playing Street Fighter Six, maybe going back to Tekken 8 for a little bit, maybe getting the Fightcade uh, thing set up on my mini PC and playing some retro fighting games. But in addition, my wife might make some food based off of the Street Fighter cookbook like she did last year, and we'll probably do uh, like a, a kind of a, a react segment where I watch my old gameplay from like Evo's past and watch me play high level Street Fighter. Uh, and then on top of that, perhaps tell some stories from back in the day from my Street Fighter days, depending on what you guys want to hear or talk about. So uh, yeah, basically I think that would be a really cool idea. Never really did anything like that besides last year. I actually did uh, the Fight and Feast, which was for the launch of Street Fighter 6 essentially. But this would be a little bit different because more like reminiscing in a variety of fighting games. That's one of the ideas. Another idea would be an Indies Marathon where you guys nominate and vote on indie games for me to try out. Likely hidden gems and things that I've completely missed over the last year or two as I haven't played that many indie games. Those usually go well <clears throat> because I get exposed to a bunch of games and usually there's a few I like and we end up playing them full, full length. Uh, or another idea someone had is a Rage-a-thon. And during a Rage-a-thon, basically what happens is people nominate games that will purposefully piss me off. Games that will get my blood boiling and challenge me and get me really, really, you know, heated. Um, we've done these in the past. Some games have worked really, really well, and some games have not worked whatsoever. Okay? Like, I think, for example, one of them was Ninja Gaiden Black. That game was very tough, and yeah, I got to a boss fight. It would kick my ass, and I was like, wow, totally get why people rage at this game. And I played Super Meat Boy. Holy shit. I think the whole game is based around repetitive deaths and rage. So it really depends on what games are nominated. It's been many, many years since I did one. So well, maybe that. So let's start talking about this regularly. Let's try to figure out what the next marathon should be. Because obviously once we hammer it in and we say it's locked, then we could start working on exactly what we want to do, you know. So we'll figure this out. But let's start talking. We still have about a month and a month and a half to figure this out. But let's start the discussion now. Okay? Cool. Um, all right. So, next topic, ladies and gentlemen, there is a documentary about me being made, and the reason why I'm talking about this one, and the reason why people are talking about this one uh, in particular, is because, number one, it is going to be the longest documentary ever made on me, and likely one of the longest documentaries ever made on anyone on YouTube. Except for, I think, Chris Chan, who has like a 700-hour documentary on him or something like that. Um, 
It's going to be made by someone who I have watched and reacted to their content before and have a friendly relationship with, <clears throat> okay? By the name of June the King, all right? For those who don't know, that's who I'm talking about. Uh, he's done documentaries on a lot of different people over the years. Tons. And like I said, I've watched some of these documentaries, reacted to them, and I like his work quite a lot. Okay? <clears throat> so, everyone knows that he's been making this documentary because he's been talking about it for months. That he's researching, he's working on it. <clears throat> for the record, yes, I have spoken with him about the documentary several times because sometimes he would be researching something or he'd be trying to get clarity on something and there just isn't enough information out there or maybe the information is unclear so he would ask me and I would try to give him my take or my side of the story or some guidance on where to get information about something um but basically to be honest here I just don't think when it comes to me that there's just a lot of archived positive information about Dark Side Phil outside of the raw content you can find on my channels and here's what I mean by that, okay? First of all, I have been a YouTuber for 16 years, much longer than most other people, all right, who are still doing it today, that is. Um, and I also was a prominent part of the fighting game community for a very long time, all right? But a lot of the stuff from those time periods isn't really, like, archived. I'll give you some perspective here. During my early fighting game days, I was a troll, and everyone knew it. Like, on big internet forums and stuff, I was a big negative asshole. And I fessed up to that, and I've told everyone how much I regret that uh, from back in that time, because now I look back and I'm like, wow, that was pretty stupid, and, you know, I probably really offended and hurt people back then just to be an asshole, and there was really no way, no reason for it. Um, and I regret it, but, I mean, that's what happens when you get older and you get more mature. You look back at your past, and you're embarrassed at the dumb shit that you've done, Right? So that, you know, you'll find documentation of that. You'll find people complaining that Dark Side Phil is an asshole and all this shit, right? But what you won't find are the stories of people who actually met me in real life at tournaments and were like, wow, you're actually not an asshole. You're actually a nice guy. You're an honorable, nice guy to get along with and joke with and play games with in person. Online, you have this heel persona of being a dick. But uh, in person, everyone who met me kind of liked me. They're like, wow, I don't understand. Why are you such an asshole online? I say, because I'm trying to build up hype for these events. You have to understand, like, that's the point, right? Get everyone excited. Get everyone shit-talking. Get everyone pumped so they'll show up. It doesn't have to all be so fucking serious. <clears throat> but, man, people hated me back then for good reason. That's what I'm trying to say. There's a justifiable reason why people didn't like me back in the days of the FGC. Now, I had this kind of, like, turnaround around 2005, 2006, and 2007 where I actually got really good at Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. And as I started to get good and actually place and win at tournaments, I realized I don't want to be an internet troll anymore. I want to turn this into something positive. So not only was I traveling all over the country, playing this game at a high level, placing and or winning at most tournaments that I entered, I also became a tournament organizer. I started running established tournament events in that no northeastern United States area, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey. I was always the guy who showed up and ran the event or helped the person who was running the event do part of the event. I didn't take any pay for any of that. I never made a dollar doing it. It was all volunteer work to help out the Street Fighter community. So in the Northeast, I was very well regarded at that time period. <clears throat> but then I retired, essentially. Around 2007, I got a back injury, and I retired, um, and I basically never got back to competitive Street Fighter ever again. So if you were to look on the internet for information about me from the Street Fighter community, all you're going to find is negative shit. Why? Because people only post the negative. You know, the people who liked me and met me in person and enjoyed the tournaments I ran didn't then go up and post a five-page thing about how much of a good time they had. Instead, they would only rant about and rage about the things they hate. Wow, this guy's a dick. This guy's an asshole. This happened at the tournament. I didn't like it. That's what you find on the internet archive. Back then, there was no recordings. There was no YouTube, no Twitch, nothing was streamed or archived whatsoever. It was all hearsay or what you saw on a forum post or in an IRC chat. That was the Street Fighter community back in the day, honestly. So that's it. So if you're, just think about this. If you're researching me and you want to find out about my true history and you search on the internet, all you're going to find is negative shit. 
that's it. That's all that's there. And the funny part about it is I don't really care. Like, that part of my life is such ancient history. I'm never going back to being part of the FGC. I've said this many times. I just have no desire to do that with my life. Um, I'm happy where I am right now, uh, and I don't actively try to do negative things anymore like that. Like, I'm so separated, right, from all of that shit that I have no desire to ever be involved with it ever again, okay? And that's a good thing. I moved on with my life many, many years. But the thing is, we have a documentary like this trying to dig up information. Now what they're going to do is look, oh, look, everything I ever found on the internet about Phil is negative. Well, yeah, because that's what people fucking complain about on the internet, the negative shit. That's what gets emphasized. That's what gets pushed to the forefront. The toxic rises to the top because people like drama, right? And man, was I all about the drama in the Street Fighter community. I really was. Like I was creating and propagating the drama to try to strum up interest for events. So essentially, um, that's what you're going to find likely in this documentary. You know, I said, well, what, what about the positive people? They don't, they're not playing Street Fighter anymore. The people who I used to hang out with in Connecticut, I have no contact with. They moved on. They have lives with families. They have no desire to be involved in a documentary about me. They, don't, they haven't played Street Fighter in over 10 years, 15 years. You know what I'm saying? I don't have contact with them. No one does because they, they're done with that. You know, the people who stick around... The, the long time people like a Justin Wong or whatever don't really know me. Justin doesn't know me. We never hung out. We were never friendly. He was from New York and was a top player who traveled with a group called Empire Arcadia that my group hated because we felt that this was like a corrupt and a real messed up group. Um, <clears throat> so there's no one around to talk about that era. There was no one documenting it, literally. There's a few things you can find. Like I said, you can find some matches of me that are archived of me winning Evo tournaments. That does exist on the internet. But that's what I mean. So here's here's another example. All right? Old controversies and things that are so outdated that no one cares anymore. But for a documentary like this, they're going to be drummed up. Right? So for example, very long ago, we're talking the very beginning of my presence being a YouTuber. There were two guys, teenagers, um who basically offered to build me a website as a fan site for free that they would operate so that my play, my fans had a place to post up stuff. They also offered at one point to build me a PC. I would pay them for it, but they would build me a PC and I guess it would somehow benefit them with some kind of, I don't know if it was a work project or a school project. I don't even know what it was. But basically this blew up into a giant controversy. Why? Because basically the PC showed up and had issues. It wasn't fully functional like they had promised. I felt like I didn't get out of it like what I had paid for. Um, a lemon, essentially. It had damage, physical damage to it when it showed up. Okay? And in addition to that, as I basically talked about this stuff publicly, trolls emerged. This is around the time where stuff like This Is How You Don't Play was starting to come out. So trolls realized that they could wedge themselves into the situation to try to exacerbate it and create drama because this is what they wanted to do. They wanted to make toxic drama on the internet. So they basically started like really getting between me and them and trying to create stuff that really shouldn't have happened. And eventually what happened was just real bad blood. And eventually they, you know, they started making, well, I say they, it was really one of them, not both of them. One of them started making like negative videos about me and stuff. Um, and then basically they, I, I told them like, I don't really want to have association with you guys because of what's going on. And they said, oh, well, you can have the website if you pay us for it. I was like, wait, what? Like, this is a fan site you created for me. I have thousands of my viewers who use it. And now you want me to buy the site from you that you offered to create for free? Yeah, you have to buy it from us now. So I did, like I, I paid them for it just to get it. You know, it was pretty messed up. Uh, but anyway. This is what I mean. Like, this is all old shit. And I don't even remember, like, the details of any of it. Like, right now, if you were to ask me, how much did you pay for that PC? I have no fucking clue. I think the narrative that we were using back then, it was like two to $3,000. But I have no evidence of that, nor do I have any real recollection of it. It's not like in 2024, I have receipts of something I bought in 2011 that I can reference. You know what I'm saying? But this is what I mean. So, for example, if June the King is making a documentary about me, and he's literally doing the most in-depth documentary about me ever in history. 
you know what he's going to do is he's going to cover all the controversies that I've ever come up against. And shit like this, like the old FGC stuff. This thing with these old moderators slash computer makers, these things will come up. And it's like, so can you defend yourself? No. How could I? There's no evidence of anything. This is ancient history, right? Perhaps in 2011, when I was buying this PC, if I thought that 13 years later, someone on the internet who makes documentaries was going to strum it up and say, where's the evidence of what you're saying? Maybe I would have some. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Do you think I care in 2024 about a PC I bought 13 years ago that I don't use? It's been retired for a decade. You know, of course I don't care. But that's the thing. That's what this documentary is essentially going to go through. It's going to go through like controversy after controversy after controversy. And you're going to have 5,000 people on one side being negative about me on the internet. And the only the thing you're going to have is like a small defense of me of what I have to say about it. Nothing documented, you know? And that's the problem with stuff like this is people only remember the negative. They only remember the toxic. What they say the person who's the most upset screams the loudest and gets remembered. And everyone else who's happy just kind of goes through life having a good time, right? So in reality, from, from what I'm to understand, this documentary will be mostly negative about me. And I'm totally okay with that. I just want everyone to understand that. Um, I never expected that a documentary that goes in depth about my history is going to be mostly positive at all because there's a lot of negative stuff and toxic stuff that's been documented about me very fairly on the internet. You know, you want to talk about the FGC days? You want to talk about this stupid controversy from that long ago? You want to talk about it? Go for it. I don't see how any of that applies to today, but that's fine. You know, if anything, what we could show is that these are dumb controversies of the past where I made big mistakes, and I've hopefully learned from them, and I, I don't repeat them, <clears throat> right? You don't hear any controversy today of me, you know, getting embroiled in a battle with someone else on the internet over something stupid like a PC or a fan site or, you know, I try to stay as far away from any drama as I can, you know? I'm not going out there poking the hornet's nest and talking shit about people and trying to cause problems like I used to in the FGC. Like, these are things that are long in my past, thankfully, all right? But that's the thing. Like, I feel like when you look at a documentary like this, it's going to be focusing on all those controversies as opposed to, you know, what is it that, that people really enjoy about filling his content? Well, people don't want to watch that. People want to hear about all the bullshit, right? So, so that's what I expect. For, so for what I'm going to understand, June the King says that this documentary will be at least four hours long. Four hours long. His longest video he's ever made. All right? For clarification purposes, when I react to something, like I reacted to a two-hour Wings of Redemption documentary, and it took me about five hours to react to it. Because essentially, I add a bunch of my own perspective, my opinions on stuff. It just it becomes huge, right? Like, I, it was a whole day to react to the Wings of Redemption documentary when I did it. Well, can you imagine me trying to react to my own documentary where I'm sure I'm going to have even more to say about the topics involved, right? So here's the thing. Number one, he says it's going to come out probably in the fall. And if that's the case... I hope it comes out early fall because as you know, that's the biggest gaming time of the year. So I hope when he says fall, he means like early September or something. You know, if this is like October, November, that's not good. I, you know, it's going to be really hard for me to try to interject reacting to this thing in the midst of the busiest gaming season of the year. Um, so I hope it's not something that takes that long, honestly. I guess we'll have to see. That's number one. Number two, taking a look at the scope of this thing, okay? The way I see it is, I want to basically react to the parts that are going to have the most interest for me and the most to add. So I'll give you some perspective. The FGC stuff, I think, is gold. Because I was there, right? And I can tell you specifically, if he has examples of people shitting on me and saying awful things about me, I can confirm or deny to what extent those are real or what the real story is. And no one else really can. There's no documented evidence of anything, so I'm the only one who has insider knowledge about that stuff, right? And again, I'll tell you right now, I was a piece of garbage from like the late 90s into the mid 2000s in the FGC. I, I, I was a real vile person online. I know I was, and I, I really regret that now. So I'll be able to 
attest to that and tell you how you know toxic I was or whatever and and talk about the full stories or whatever he's found out about that okay on the flip side if there's something that's just complete bullshit I'll tell you that too all right I, I'm very interested in his take on my earlier days as a youtuber when YouTube was just being formative and you know really didn't have a, a, an established formula for success and stuff like what he thinks about the old days of YouTube and the content that I put out and stuff like that I'm fascinated by that because again I'm I didn't know what the hell I was doing I didn't take it seriously I was just being stupid and irreverent and I know I made tons of, dis of mistakes back then you know by not taking it so seriously and, and not caring about what I said or did you know a lot of harmful stuff a lot of, a lot of dumb shit happened back then uh, I'm fascinated to go through that right but what I'm not really interested in is any of the bullshit that's happened in like the last five years that's the same tired shit about finances, my bankruptcy, fucking mobile games, how I spend money, how I do this and that, which first of all is no one's fucking business at all. It never was. These are my attempts of my trolls to delve into my personal matters of my life and business that is no one's fucking business whatsoever because they just basically want to hurt me, right? And I've already said my piece on this stuff a million times. You know, I said it in an interview last year. I've said it in my own content. I've said it a hundred times. You know what I'm saying? My opinions and or my answers to any of those issues are never going to change. So what's the point? If he has a whole hour of the documentary about the last five years where everyone's talking about my financials and shit, right? I'm probably not going to react to that. I don't see the point. I'll literally be sitting there and be saying, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true, but I'm not gonna show you evidence of what's true because it's my business and not yours, and it's harmful if I show it to you, right? There's no point in, why do you wanna see me react to something you know I'm not gonna talk about? I'm just be like, nope, not talking about it, private stuff, fuck off, not your business, right? So, this is what I mean, like I feel like a bunch of this documentary would be fascinating for me to react to, and really good stuff, and then a whole chunk of it is basically going to be stuff that I would never even want to waste time on, okay? So the other thing is, and I have absolutely no idea if he is going to do this or not, I want someone to analyze the actual people who stalk and hate on me on a constant basis to find out about them. That's what I think is even more fascinating because as, as interesting it'll be to go through my history, right? I think to find the people who have become the biggest stalkers, haters, like what kind of people are they? Why do they do what they do? What is their reasoning? What kind of lives do they lead? Are they normal people or are they really weirdos? Maybe they're normal people who are just completely obsessed. I, I That would be more fascinating to me, but I don't think anyone's done that. that, you know? And I don't think June's doing that either. Just be clear, I don't think so. Maybe he is, I don't know. I'm not there looking at what he's doing, you know? So. That would be more, if he ever has something like that, that would be super entertaining, I feel. And I would definitely react to that, but I don't know, right? So I guess we're gonna see, because again, no one's gonna know until this thing is out. But my, here's my prediction. It's gonna be 90% negative. Seriously, I mean that too. I think like most of it's gonna be, here's the, all the things Phil did wrong in history, laid out, and here's the evidence of it because this is all that's on the internet is negative shit about it, right? The people who actually liked me and enjoyed my content, they sit here, they watch, they they interact, they contribute, and they move on. They're not making giant documentaries about how good Phil is. There's no compilation videos of the best stuff. It's just negative, 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 negative. That's the shit that gets attention on the, on the internet, and that's what's going to be all over the internet, right? Nothing positive, just negative shit. I'm okay going down memory lane and and reliving all that shit with you guys and explaining what I was going through or, the, you know, fessing up to the mistakes I've made. I think I did a good job of that with the Frederick Nudson documentary a couple of years ago. So I have no problem doing this with the June the King documentary. But again, I don't want to get everyone's hopes up because number one, if this comes out in the middle of the busiest gaming season, I can't just drop everything to just constantly be reacting to this thing. You know, I can't. It has to be maybe a slow burn kind of a deal um, where I go through it slowly, you know, and we'll see. Or... If it does come out at a time when there's no games, then I, I go into it more heavily. I'm okay with that too. You know what I mean? But we have to see what happens with it because I'm not clear exactly how it's going to go um, until we eventually just, you know, it, it's out, right? If it's four hours, like I said, dude, if it's four hours long for real, no exaggeration, that could be 
10 to 12 hours of content that I'm going to be making out of it. But again, if, it, if a big chunk of this is about, you know, the recent couple of years or, or five, I would say it was like a five year period, right? Where basically I was going through financial troubles around 2018, 2019, went through the bankruptcy. People completely got themselves involved in that, which is fucked up because they never should have. It was completely against the law So they did. Um, and then ever since then, people have been on my ass about every single dollar I make and spend and all that bullshit, right? So that I'm really not interested in. What I'm interested in is his takes on my content, my history, all that stuff. And I would also like to hear a final thoughts. Like overall, he probably thinks I'm an asshole. All right. I wouldn't be surprised if that's not his final take. Wow. Phil's been an amazing asshole, but I'd at least like to see if he has some opinion on if I've improved and if I've become a better person and a better creator, despite the fact that look at the sacrifices I've made to do that. You know, I could have become a toxic drama centric ass like everyone seems to want to pull me into right they constantly be on the lol cow podcast and be a toxic person to this guy and insult this one and do this and i don't do that i just sit here and i just make content for my audience and i just chill and because of that i'm a small time guy i could have gone the opposite way to try to blow shit up and get attention for myself and i haven't and i'm that's a that's a definite designed choice that i want to stay in my lane and not be toxic to the to people on the internet you know um so I'm curious overall, if you were to look at my whole history from start to finish, right? Like what you think? He's probably gonna say I'm a piece of gar garbage. I'm, I wouldn't be shocked. I'm seriously, I would not be shocked if like his overall opinion is that he, he thinks I'm a jerk or I'm an asshole or, you know, I don't, you know, it is what it is, I guess, you know, that's, that's, that's life. At least I'm happy to know that people who spend time with me on a daily basis do enjoy my company and like my content, you know, but yeah, uh, overall, does it suck to know that someone who looks at your history it thinks uh, at the end of the day that it's, you're a very negative asshole? Yeah, it sucks. That's why I'm trying to change. That's why I want to be a better person. I hope people feel I am. I, I feel like if I wasn't, I wouldn't be happily married. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like if I was still the same toxic jerk that no one would ever want to be with me and, you know, you guys wouldn't want to hang out with me anymore. It would just be everyone making fun of me constantly and there'd be no positivity in my content. So I hope for the best, but you never know, right? <clears throat> now, um, anyway, in regards to this, like I said, we will have to talk more about it as it approaches. And once we've got like set dates and when it's going to come out and stuff and figure out how exactly it's going to be covered, to what extent I'm going to cover it, etc. All right. But I've already laid the groundwork here. Yes, I'm interested in reacting to it for sure. But mostly the parts that interest me where I feel like I can add something to, I can't add stuff to stuff I'm not going to talk about because it's harmful, right? I can't, I can't talk about my personal fucking business finances and shit and stuff that legally I'm tied, I can't, I can't even say, you know, that stuff is always is going to be off the table. So, you know, a big chunk of the, the documentary likely will be off the table. So maybe out of this four-hour documentary, I can only react to two or three hours. I don't know. But we'll see. All right, we'll see and we'll go from there. Um, and by the way, I just want to say, to June the King, he's been very respectful the whole time. Like, he's reached out to me for, for clarification purposes on certain issues and for more elaboration and to get my takes. And I know he's going to probably have my takes on stuff in the documentary that he asked me. And that's fine. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, even if he disagrees with me, I, I would bet some of the things that I remember were wrong. Like, for example, that whole stupid PC thing. I really don't remember the, the actual situation. I think I remember the generalities of the situation. But I don't remember the specifics. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, He'll go back and he'll look at a video where I say, oh, the PC was $3,000. And he'll be like, yeah, but I looked and it actually was 1000 He'll show the receipts or whatever. Like, I don't have receipts. <laughs> you know, I don't have, I don't care either. Like, it's such an old issue and no one gives a shit about it, right? So I feel like that's going to be some of the stuff that's going to be in there. It's like, well, whatever, you got me, right? That's why I don't get involved with this kind of shit anymore. I just don't. I don't, don't want to cause drama on the internet over nonsensical stuff that doesn't matter, you know? But... We'll see. All right, so anyway, that's what's going on. And obviously, more on that as we get closer to its release, which seems like it's quite a ways away. Uh, I guess we'll get more uh, we'll get more uh, information on it soon, right? Cool. Okay. Um, we have one news story for today that I want to cover. It's a real weird one, okay? It's a really weird news story. Just listen to this. So there's an indie game company. All right, called Possibility Space. 
and they announced overnight they're going out of business and closing the studio. The reasoning is some of the weirdest I've ever heard, all right? So basically, the owner of the company is named Jeff Strain, and he sent out a letter to all employees about this, okay? I'm just going to read it word for word. You ready for this? So this is a, an, a, imagine you're working as a game developer on a game for an indie company. You have no idea what goes on behind closed doors or behind the scenes. All you're doing is you're making a game. You're getting a paycheck, right? Here's what he sent to everyone. I'm going to read it word for word. Late last week, I received a list of topics and questions from Ethan Gatch, a reporter at Kotaku, regarding an article he's writing about Pretania Media and the closure of Crop Circle Games. Much of it was expected, but I was also stunned to see non-public information about Project Vonnegut. That's the name of their game. Disclosure of our publishing partner with details of our business and financial relationship and details of internal P&L, profit and loss. Discussions and confidential all-company meetings. Mr. Gatch specifically credits current employees as the source of all of this information. Leaks of this nature are typically malicious and done by outside hacking. So to see internal team members under a confidentiality, confidentiality agreement engage in this was shocking. Given the company's own strict confidentiality and notification obligations, I immediately got on a plane for in-person meetings with our publishing partner to disclose this information breach and discuss the impact on the project. During that discussion, our partner expressed low confidence that they would be willing to invest the additional resources needed to complete the game, so we mutually ag agreed we're canceling Vonnegut. As a result of the cancellation of the publishing relationship, and after careful consideration, I am closing Possibility Space. Today is your last day of employment with Possibility Space and pre Pretania Media. Your final paycheck, including pay for work through the end of today, will be deposited to your account, along with any other required payments as dictated by your work location. And then basically, it just has a whole bunch of legal mumbo jumbo about who's getting paid for what, and there may be severance pay or not, depending on where you live. Um, I retained a DC-based global law firm to oversee the wind down of our studio. An employment attorney from the firm will soon follow up with your personal email address and additional details, and that person will be your direct point of contact from here on on all matters related to your employment. And I'm, I'm just, you know, skimming through a bit. You can keep all of your development equipment provided you permanently delete all company confidential information, confirm you've done so in writing, and strictly abide by your existing confidentiality obligations, including proper handling of company IP and other confidential and proprietary information. As of today, I am stepping away from game development and the industry to focus on my family and care for Annie. I don't know, maybe that's his daughter or something or his wife. I don't know. I wish all of you the best as you navigate the complex industry and the challenges and opportunities ahead. So overnight, you're a game dev. Everything is fine. The next day, you get this email. You're fired. You may or may not have severance pay, depending on where you work. You may or may not be able to keep the shit that you have. Like, for example, what if you had, like, a work laptop? You could just keep it. What? Yeah, you could just keep it. Just delete all the stuff about our company, but that's your laptop now. Huh? Where did, when did that ever happen? Never. In, I don't think I've ever heard of a company that you get fired, but they let you keep the assets you got from the company. Just keep them. What? <laughs> really? You don't want it back? Just li liquidate it? No, just keep it. Like, what? So, you might say, well, what's, what's so weird about this? Okay? So, to summarize, for those who didn't understand all that stuff, so basically, there seemed to be some kind of questions regarding the legality of the financing of this company. Okay? Kotaku was researching an article about it, and em employees, apparently, according to the CEO, gave the Kotaku journalist inside info that they should not have given them per a confidentiality agreement, including all the information about the investments firm or whatever that was financing the game. So in a panic, the CEO went to meet with the investment firm or the, the, the financiers of the game. And they said, well, in light of all this, uh, we just don't want to finance your game anymore, so goodbye. And they cut the cord, so now the company literally has no money because they don't have a game yet, and so they're going out of business, okay? And it's like, huh? What on earth? Now, 
to just even add more fuel to the fire of how weird this situation is. Five days ago, I'm not kidding you. Five days ago, the CEO, okay, of this company, Possibility Space, made this post. Game developers simply deserve better than what is happening in our industry right now. Let me say it plainly. Layoffs are the result of bad management and poor strategic management and bad decision making. Game developers are not Legos to be discarded when the structure no longer needs them. They are human beings with families, pets, friends, and communities who rely on them. Profitable companies conducting mass layoffs of the actual people who make their successful products is astonishingly bad for business and morality, morally vile. All I can say to the devs impacted in the last few months, this is not your fault. Take care of yourself to the best of your ability and have hope. The epics, blizzards, etc., etc. of tomorrow are starting small and will grow up to be new and different and better. I'm personally sending love and support to every developer struggling out there. <clears throat> so it sounds to me like this guy was well-intentioned, wanted to start a company that was not going to be like the other companies that just cut the cord and discard you. But because of what happened here, he just can't because he has no money and he went out of business, right? So I guess the question here is what really happened? And the answer is we won't know unless until the smoke kind of clears here. Um, But it's just the weird... Have you ever heard that as the result of a journalistic article being researched that a company completely went out of business right like the article didn't even come out and they went out of business that's just weird like what what the truth is what is the core thing that was being researched for the article like is it that they think that the financing was like illegal or something or not kosher or you know like i don't i don't get it like what was kotaku researching um a lot of people are pointing their finger at Kotaku saying, shame on Kotaku because of what you did. A company is now out of business and people lost their jobs. A lot of people are pointing their finger at the CEO saying, what kind of an operation were you running that all your financing was based on one company and just because publicly it was going to be known they were your financer that then they pulled the plug? Like, what's that about? So it's just a, I mean, it's a weird, unique situation. And I think we're going to get more information on it over time. Like this controversy has just begun. And so more research will be done. People will try to find more out about it. But it's just the weirdest thing. Uh, 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 overnight, a company completely closing. For what? Like, what happened? You know? I'm, I'm curious, like, what, what's wrong with a company financing a game? Like, what's up with, was the company a political company or something? Were they politically charged and didn't want to know that they were involved with the game development or something? I don't know. It's very weird. And by the way, the name, is, the game, name of the game was v Project Vonnegut. Like, Kurt Vonnegut, the writer? What? What kind of game was this? <laughs> like, I, I can't think of a, of a game based on the writings of Kurt Vonnegut that would be much of a financial success unless it has took very creative liberties. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm very confused about it. So, I guess, like I said, if more information becomes available, I'll, I'll tell you guys. I'll cover it further. But... This is really confusing me, and I just have never seen a situation like this before happen, so I'm intrigued, and I want more. But the thing is, we may never know. There may be legal agreements in place. Like you said, there's confidentiality agreements in place that these people are not supposed to be talking publicly about it. At the same time, someone already leaked this email. An internal company email that should have never been leaked is on the internet right now. That's what I just read you. So there's obviously there's employees that just don't give a shit, right? Okay. Anyway, I think it's time to get to shout outs, shall we? It's already 1220, so I think we should begin with shout outs. We start off with BB Phil, who did a super chat saying, ever consider selling coaching sessions? No. No, I'm, I don't think that paying for coaching is something I'm interested in. BB Phil uh, did a super chat. He said, most of the guys from the hate crew, you mean team hate, the old fighting game community group? Have public profiles that are easy to contact. They're indeed a bit puzzled by the sudden interest, so I backed off like you told me to. Yeah, because again, you sh there's no reason for anyone to be bothering people about this shit. They probably don't care, <laughs> right? They probably don't want to be bothered by this. They're like, why would you bring this up? I didn't bring it up. Someone else did. And now people, of course, want to make shit out of it, so I'm not going to talk about it. It's that simple. Like, I have nothing to do with it. I told you, I am disconnected from the FGC. I want nothing to do with the subject. Okay. Um, so, BB Phil, thank you, but please stop talking about it. 
I'm just gonna warn you now. If people are, are being now contacted about it, that's fucked up. And just shut up about it. I don't ever want to hear about it again. Okay. <clears throat> no, because I'll tell you why. This is exactly what people want. They want to create drama. So, for example, this whole situation I was just talking about with these two guys who made a fan site for me, made a PC, and all that. This That situation was 100% fueled and exacerbated by trolls. And what I mean by that is, it should have been just a behind-the-scenes thing between us. Instead, the trolls kept interjecting. They kept contacting the guy and bothering him. That would stir him to make a video and this and that and go back and forth. That was one of the original times that happened. Another time that happened was with my friend John Rambo, where here I am making my content, answering questions in Q&A, and the trolls would take my answers, and they would go then to John and say, look what Phil said, and he, and he means this, and he insinuates this, and basically they tried to put a wedge between us, all right? So every time that people try to get fucking involved with this shit because they're stalker idiots, they try to fuck things up for people. And usually it's not even stuff that I'm involved with. Like, like for example, in this case, I literally haven't talked to any FGC people in a million years, right? I just, I've, I'm not involved in it. I have a life separate from that. I don't care. Anyone who's going out of their way to talk or contact with FGC people, for me, you're barking up the wrong tree. It doesn't affect me at all. All you're doing is you're bothering and harassing people. And I don't want that. So that's why. Stop bringing it up. Literally, I don't want, want to fucking hear it again. Period. And if I see it, I'm going to get pretty fucking pissed off. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> Let's continue. Um. So with tips today, we start off with a troll. So I just ignore that moron. Go fuck yourself. And then I got another tip from... Uh, let's see here. From Sarah, who tips a dollar and says, If you're given the opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with your biggest detractors who are obsessed and make negative videos about you and have an off-camera conversation, would you have it? No. Why would I ever want to do that? I keep trying to explain to people, I don't care. I'm not that kind of guy. Like, I know, listen, I know I'm never going to please everyone on the internet. I'm never going to please everyone on this planet. There's always people who, some people like you, some people hate you. I've long accepted that I'm not going to be some regarded positive figure on the internet because so many people have said so many awful things about me. It, that will never happen, okay? People have the right to say bad things and or criticize. They don't have the right to slander, defame, or try to ruin my life, okay? There's a big, there's a line between that. Sadly, a lot of people don't understand that line and they don't care what extents they go to to benefit off of my misery, okay? So that being said, and knowing those people exist, right? Why in the holy hell would I ever, ever want to speak to those people? It's obvious that they either have no moral compass, so they don't, they're never, you're never going to reason with someone who doesn't understand morality or reason. They are just, I just want to benefit. I don't care. I just want to benefit, right? <clears throat> you know, for someone like, for, for me, maybe talking to someone who back in the day used to be a big critic of me for morality reasons. You know, the fact that people said, man, you really were too harsh on game devs back in the day when you did your commentary. Even if you were joking, it's kind of harmful the things that you said. Man, you were over the top with the sexual comments, the racial comments, that stuff needed to be toned down directly. Man, you just did not listen to feedback. You were obstinate. You were like a boulder that you're talking to and wouldn't respond. People wanted you to improve and do different things to make your content better for your own good, and you didn't listen. Those are all valid criticisms. And if anyone, someone wanted to talk about something like that, especially someone from the past, that's more fascinating to me, right? Not these people today who, as we talked about yesterday, the only reason they're in for it <clears throat> is profit. They don't care if what they say or do is anything positive. Or excuse me, if what I say or do is anything productive or positive or, or um, all they care about is making money, right? So any way that they can make the money off of it. Why would I want to talk to someone like that? I already know that they're a scumbag. There's nothing fascinating to get out of talking to those people. If someone wanted to do a documentary on those people, you get the inside story of who they are, why they do what they do, how underhanded the shit they do is, how they think that they're, they're whole. like I said yesterday, these people have communities and the communities criticize me for what I say. I'll, I will say someone in Street Fighter who literally just mashes a pattern with no thought is a mouth drooler. And they say, that's very offensive. 
And then they go on to say things like people in my community are wheelchairs or dents to insanely offensive comments or, or, or terms about handicapped people that should never be said. And they just say it over and over like it's normalized in their community to say that that's fine. They can say that really fucked up, but God forbid that I say something about someone's skill level in, in a fighting game, right? But that's what I mean. That should, what should be looked at and analyzed. Not, oh, what did Phil do today in Street Fighter when he raged? Like, what the fuck? That's not even interesting. It's not. There's stuff going on over there. Like, it's funny because they all like to say that Phil's the lol cow. No, no, no. Those communities are way more interesting than me. Therefore, they're the lol cows. Go analyze them. Go make them act out and see how they react. Like, with their infighting and their horse shit. That's the fascinating thing to study. Not me. I'm just a normal dude playing games and having fun with a few people online every day. There's nothing so dramatic or interesting here. You know what I'm saying? At all. It's just... <laughs> it just nothing at all. It's them making the drama. That's the fascinating subject. So go check them out, not me. Right? And leave me alone. And vice versa. I have no desire to talk to them or become involved with them at all. I don't care. I don't even know who most of them are. I only know about them because you come into my chat and you'll, rec you'll say a word about them. You know, I'll be like, oh... That's who it is. I don't even know. I don't know. I, I literally right now couldn't name, besides this duty streams guy, I couldn't even name like another one of these modern detractors of mine. They're just the, the next generation of fucking loser who just does this over and over and over. So whatever. <clears throat> okay. Um, Hold on a second here. I received three tips. The first tip is a $10 tip. <laughs> a $10 tip from One Minute Man. And he says, My analysis of the detractors yesterday was pretty good, but far from complete. To do so might require a master's level thesis. <laughs> yes, I, I agree with you there. We're going to keep going because he has more to say here. to $11 a tip so far. To do so... Uh, okay. Your best shot at getting a fair analysis of your situation is by a YouTuber called Dr. Grande. He has analyzed a wide range of people, even Joe Rogan. All of his videos are in response to requests. In any case, you need to determine what you mean by detractors. Are restreamers the same people who try to damage your livelihood? As you said, it doesn't make sense. If you're out of business, they're out of business. Okay. I received an $8 tip. Okay. Animation here. Add that. He says, For you to understand your situation, some self-awareness is vital. Without it, nothing will ever change. You have matured over the years, but you're not there yet. Firstly, you need to realize combination of your playing style and in-game reactions while entertaining can create opposite reactions with others. In addition, your bombastic and emotional response... Look at bombastic. I don't think I've ever used that word before. Your bombastic and emotional response to certain comments and messages is at times predictable. So people love to yank your chain. Sometimes you rise above it, sometimes you don't. Those moments are what streamers love. One of the main rules online is never lose your cool. If you do, you make yourself a target. Fair enough. <clears throat> All right, bombastic. This is great. Bombastic. I love that word. <laughs> it's like the word itself sounds like bombs exploding, right? Bombastic. All right. Then he did a $6 tip. So thank you for that. That gets us to $25 a tip so far today. He says, uh, if you had created a YouTube persona, perhaps like Dr. Disrespect, and you separated that character's comments from your real self, you would at least have a layer of protection against personal attacks. Presenting yourself as a real person is very risky and the most risky thing anyone could do online unless you're Mother Teresa or someone with a very pleasant, likable, agreeable, non-polarizing personality. In real life, everyone hides something. You can never truly know someone. Protecting the privacy of your true self, whatever you perceive it to be, is as important as protecting things like health, your social security number, your banking info, your email, your YouTube account, and other things. And fair enough, because a lot of people have said that over the years. They said, gee, is DSP a character or is he a real person, right? And to some extent, 
I, I feel like the stuff that I used to do back in the day was absolutely overblown, over the top. Some of that commentary I used to do on fighting games, like Street Fighter 4, that was 100% done on purpose. Really inflammatory stuff to get a reaction, right? But that's the thing. Like, sometimes it's real. Sometimes it's it's fabricated. But it's it's depending on the situation and stuff. And the thing is, some people are in on the joke. Some people aren't. Some people are just like, again, they're kind of ignorant. Now, someone, Abdullah says something interesting in the chat. He says, the comment is kind of dead false. Boogie has a character named Francis, but people still hate him. I will agree and disagree with that comment. Yes, Boogie has a character named Francis, but the character is not representative of who he is. It's supposed to be a character that he acts, and then the people just don't like Boogie because of Boogie. They don't dislike Boogie because of the Francis character. In fact, people kind of know the Francis character's fake, so they like the character. They don't like Boogie. And the things that he does and says and the way that he behaves, <clears throat> that's where they got the problem with him, the man, not the character, right? I, I, I will agree with One Minute Man. In a case like Dr. Disrespect, he's literally a cartoon character. I think we can all agree. He dresses up like a fucking reject G.I. Joe, right? He look he literally looks like a G. I. the G.I. Joe from the second wave G.I. Joe that was terrible. It was like comic relief, terrible stuff. And the stuff he says and does is over the top stupid but people like it because it's a character, right? I think they know that's not representative of the real guy. He's literally acting a role to get attention and people like the character, right? So to some extent, that's great, right? Hey, and now you can't say anything that he says is necessarily 100% accurate to what he really feels because it's a character. When I started on YouTube, again, I, I called myself the realest motherfucker on the internet. Do you remember that? That's old, that's ancient. But that's the kind of stuff I used to say. You know, because I said, when I'm going to rate a game, I'm telling you the truth. I have no way to sugarcoat or crap on it. Either way, I don't benefit. So you know I'm telling you the truth about a game that I'm reviewing, right? And then I would go and I would play Street Fighter, and I would say, like, insanely offensive insults to the people I was playing. And people would be like, wow, the realest motherfucker on the internet is a real asshole, Right? So, listen, I'm to blame. I know that. I'm to blame for that shit back in the day. I really am. Uh, my, the Street Fighter stuff, the early YouTube stuff, this is all my fault because I didn't have any guide. I didn't have a PR manager or a manager at all to guide me. I didn't have a firm telling me what to do. I didn't have any blueprint, any history of anyone else who had done it before me. I was just winging it. I was shooting from the hip constantly and seeing what worked. And I would try to stick with what worked. And what worked earlier on was basically being as over-the-top, offensive, pulling no punches, saying whatever I wanted, as much as I possibly could, without being outright racist or sexist, you know. It wasn't like I was constantly ragging on a certain race or anything like that. Right? I called myself the equal opportunity offender. I didn't want, no one was safe. Everything would be made fun of in my content, right? So people kind of knew the joke back then. But then, you know, people then took that into, oh, well, guess what? Now he's a racist. Now he's a sexist. You know, as times change and culture changed. Um, but I agree. You know, I'm not, I'm certainly have room to improve. I still have to work on things like anger issues, when, especially when it comes to fighting games and other things. Um, I certainly have to work on, you know, like you said, taking the bait. You're right. There's things that people will say to take the bait. And it's like, what, what gets me is it doesn't matter. Again, it doesn't matter what I say or do. No matter what, it's a rant. Like, if I simply answer a question today, calmly, wow, Phil really went on a rant today. I sat here and I answered a question calmly, and I ranted somehow, according to the people who don't like me, right? Because again, saying I ranted, it's clickbait. But I mean, so, but you're right. Like, there's certain things that maybe I should just completely ignore. I don't know, you know, but it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. Like, there's certain, right now I get certain tips and I know it's a troll, and I just ignore it. I say, gee, thanks, I just move on. I'm not gonna sit here and waste time on that shit, you know? It's just trying to get me worked up or whatever, and I know who these people are now, so I could just completely ignore them. Um. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I agree with, with One Minute Man that I need to grow and improve, and definitely I agree that analyzing my detractors could be like a, like I said, a master's thesis or a fucking, uh, you know, one of these giant scientific journal documents that gets filed, you know, after years of research, here's what we've discovered about atom cracking. Oh, by the way, here's also what we discovered about DSP's detractor community. <laughs> you know? 
Uh, let's see here. I got a dollar fifty tip from Ploppy. Can I get an unban? I did nothing wrong. Yeah, your name is absolutely disgusting. It's a shit filled toilet, and I'm not going to have you in my chat. Change your name and come back, uh, or or just make a new account. Um, Monty Mole, thank you for a super chat. Dank did a super chat. Said something about the term you're thinking about is a mouth breather. Actually, no. That's not that's not the term that I was. I know that's another term that can be used as like an insult or whatever. But no, for me, I that's not the term that I was trying to use. And Big Fridge did a super chat. Says, would you go on Joe Rogan to clear things up? Uh, Joe Rogan would never care about me in any realm of any kind of parallel dimension or multiverse. Joe Rogan doesn't give a shit. I'm I'm a tiny tiny potatoes. You know what I mean? No one cares about me in that regard. I would never be a big enough important person for someone like Joe Rogan to want to speak to. <laughs> in any, in, you know what I mean? People have said that for years. Would you go on the Joe Rogan podcast? What? Joe Rogan has celebrities, political figures, you know, newsworthy people on his show. He doesn't have a small-time YouTuber who gets 300 views as a video uh, on his show. Uh, JJ and S doesn't really matter. He says, well, documentaries and other things going on with videos, what will future generations think about you? It, it won't matter. I'll be dead. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it, what matters is the here and now that I am making content for people that they enjoy, that they find either entertainment or distraction or, or sometimes actual factual analysis, intelligence from the things that I do. Whatever it is that people get out of my content, right? That they're getting that out of it now. It doesn't matter what happens in history. In in 200 years time, no one will remember any of us anyway. We'll all be long dead. No one will give a shit. It doesn't matter, you know? It, it, seriously. Do you think that anyone talks about what happened 200 years ago? Right now, it's 2024. Who's talking about what happened in 1824? Nobody gives a shit, right? I'll be a footnote. Of a footnote, of a footnote, of a footnote, of a footnote, in the annals of internet video creation, no one will care about Dark Side Phil once I'm gone. You know, it is it's over, right? And you know, just be honest. Look at sadly people who have passed. You know, you know guys like uh, Total Biscuit. He was super prominent. Everyone talked about him. At, you know, top of the community. He passes away. I never hear about Total Biscuit anymore. Like not any. I don't even hear a reference to him anymore. You know what I mean? That's just how, the nature of life. Once you're gone, unle you know, you're gone. And that's it. So, I don't really think anyone's going to give a crap about me uh, after that. All I care about is now. What, you know, who I help now, what stuff we do together now, and how I help people now. That's what I care about. <clears throat> there you go. Uh, I received a dollar tip from Kirk. Joe Rogan used to watch you. He said one of your catchphrases Hulk out on one of his podcasts. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, Kirk, but thanks for the dollar tip. It's completely wrong. <laughs> completely false. Anyway, uh, Shell Ryukin just did a whopping $20 super chat. Thank you, Shell Ryukin. Hope you're doing well. He says, I know you've done a lot of RPG content. Would you consider doing Infinite Wells post-game as a chill stream in the future like you do with Yakuza 7? Uh, what tier do you think Marisa is in Street Fighter 6? Um... First of all, the answer sadly is no, Show you can. We had such RPG burnout on this channel after having played RPGs so much for two to three year or two to three month period that I just don't think anyone's going to care to see me go back to Like a Dragon. It's sad because I like the game a lot. Uh, certainly not a perfect game, but yeah, I just don't. I sadly don't think that this channel has a desire to see me do that. All right, um, I would like to do that. Like, seriously, I would like to go back and grind and, you know, unlock other things in the game, but... <clears throat> yeah, no. The problem was too much RPGs in a short period of time. If if that had been the only RPG out and we played it for, like, two months, beat it, I don't think people would have had a problem having that being, like, a late-night chill stream. You know, just hanging out and, and doing some dungeon grinding or whatever. But, man, RPGs wore out their welcome. And we've got RPGs on deck. we got Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I'm only 20 hours into on hold. 
We got Dragon Dogma 2 I don't know if I'll ever go back to. We got Sea of Stars that I want to go back to later in the year. We already have other RPGs ready to go. <clears throat> so going back to that one is pretty much a no-go. As for how is Marisa ranked in Street Fighter 6, I have no clue. When the game first came out, people were ranking her very highly. And then I'd say midway through its life cycle so far, people said she's bad. And now, like, what for what I see, when I, remember when I was using Dalsim? Originally, when I was using Dalsim, I was dominating, like, every Marisa I fought. Then I played Dalsim against Marisa this week. And the Marisa seemed to know every trick in the book to stop Dalsim. And I was like, holy shit. Like, I didn't even know she could do half that stuff. And I was shocked that she could pull that off. Because a lot of people were using her almost like a one-trick pony-style character. So maybe now the gameplay has advanced to the point where she's better. I, I really don't know. I'll be honest. I haven't followed the tiers for a long time. I was following them to, to about the end of last year. And now this year, I really haven't looked at them at all. I don't know with the, the rebalance patch that came out uh, like a month ago with the release of Ed, if that has changed things. Likely, I, I'm not going to care that much right now. Um, likely when Season 2 comes out, when there's the full rebalance and everything's tweaked, that's when I'm going to relook at the game in a competitive way, see if I want to try out other characters, which hint, hint, I probably will try a few new characters that I hadn't used previously, uh, especially if there's a big rebalance effort, <laughs> and go from there. But... Uh, I really don't know. I don't know. Mar I would say Marisa's not bottom tier. And definitely she's not upper top tier. Maybe mid. I don't know. Maybe Blanca level. Don't know. Okay. Um. Thank you so much for the super chat, by the way. Much appreciated. Um, Kirk did, tipped another dollar. He says, sometimes you're too hard on yourself. You're funny and smart and talented and famous. Uh, some people think I'm funny. Some people think I'm smart. Some people think I'm talented. I don't think anyone's going to say I'm famous. Maybe infamous, but I do not consider myself famous in any capacity of the word. I, If you wanted to say over 10 years ago, like at the height of my popularity, 2011, 2012-ish, <clears throat> when I could go to a convention and actually have like a panel held at the convention when tons of people were there for me, when I have people lining up to get my autograph, then I was famous. Okay, not anymore. Now, nobody gives a shit about Dark Side Phil besides a small, tight-knit group of fans who like my content and a whole bunch of assholes who just want to make fun of me. That's it. So, there you go. All right. Any final things to talk about, everyone, before we adjourn today? Uh, and then uh, take a break, use the restroom, and then I'll come back and continue with Elden Ring. I got another dollar fifty tip from Return of Ploppy. I've done his ass now unban. I have Return of Ploppy. This is disgusting. I'm just gonna. If you keep doing stupid tips like this, I'm just not gonna read them. Okay. All right. Great. Hmm. Stupid idiot. Okay. I cough. Welcome. Says, I've been here as a fan since you played shit on your camera. Love your energy. Well, thank you for being around so long. Are we good? I guess we're good. People seem to be all right. All right. So, thanks for a great show. Oh, man. Now I stretch now. Of all times, at the end of the show, I decide to stretch on camera. Thanks for a great show. Great topics discussed today, and I hope you all enjoy. Uh, I shall... <clears throat> excuse me. I shall see you all tomorrow, when I'm sure we'll be talking about how the co-op went. And I'm fascinated to see. Hopefully, Scott likes the game and ends up being really fun. We have a good time. And uh, I wish you all the best. Happy weekend to everyone. I'll see you all tomorrow for another fun podcast. Peace out.